Can you just explain a little bit of how this miracle again, another God's hand in it, gave you this heart within 24 hours? Well, once an individual is put onto a transplant list, the time that you get the organ is unknown, whether it's a lung, a heart, a liver, whatever it is. Nobody knows because essentially what has to happen? Someone has to pass away in order to get that organ. Yes. So nobody knows. It could be six months. It could be a year. You may not get it at all. You might not survive mm -hmm. because you have to have that exact match. So that's an unknown. Once you're put on the list, it's just a waiting game. Did you think about your decision? Did you second guess what you were talking now that it's right here? Of mm -hmm. course. You know, my husband okay. actually said to Dr. Mitchell, is there anything else we can do? Anything. I mean, is, is that it? Mm -hmm. And he was like, yes, we're talking 29%. Mm -hmm. And time is of the essence. Mm -hmm. Ooh, I just had to okay. catch my breath. So, <laughs> I'm over here like, <laughs> woo! Yeah. So, so, so we turn around, you get the heart, and well, they tell you there's a heart available. Can you bring into the prep and, you know, how do you get your baby ready for this? And what, what was your attitude, Cassandra, about a new heart? It was nighttime. My mom had came in there uh, in the room and had and told me, you know, very like softly, you know, because my mom has a soft voice, <laughs> um, very comforting, you know, kind of just like, you know, this is what's going on. And I think I was just kind of like, what? Like, ah. yeah, like what and honestly kind of like what does that mean like I never you know I never had you know experience being in a hospital like this I never you know I was in seventh seventh grade so it was just like what are we talking about you know well you know we thought about it we didn't have much time because her heart was in such a critical condition they put her on that list and let me tell you it was another God thing Bill Less than 24 hours, mm. a heart became available. What? Mm -hmm. Yes, Bill. For Less us, than 24 for us, hours. For us? Yes. You, yes. you know what I'm saying, right? Yes, yes I do. <laughs> yes, Bill. For us, within 24 yes. hours, a heart became available. Less than 24 hours. Mm. Oh, mm. my land. Talking about God. Now, when you, this. Yeah. Oh, yes. When you get an organ, it has to be an exact match because if it's not, believe it or not, your body will reject it and it'll cause more trouble, you know, than it's worth. So it has to be an exact match. I remember one of my cousins came in the room and my mom was there. She talked to my mom. I remember I just, you know, saw them talking. And then, then I remember 
my grandma was there. It was it was a lot of family that was that was in the room. Mm -hmm. And I remember like the doctors came in. They're like, you know, we got now it's, it's, it's time. I do remember being scared because I think it was just kind of like. I don't really know these people, like these doctors, you know, I don't, I don't even really know what's going on, you know, heart transplant, like, what is it going to be like when I was on life support and I had, you know, the lung surgery, I hadn't been awake at all, but, you know, I had, I had been awake at that point for a little bit of time. So it was just kind of like, oh my gosh, like, am I going to come back alive? Like, it was just kind of, you know, type of like, what's gonna happen in that room, <laughs> no, that, literally. That's really my question, my next question. Did you, mm -hmm. at that age, did you have a sense of the seriousness of what was going on? I don't think so. I think the way that I understood the seriousness was having all the tubes and having, you know, everything in my body. Um, but I don't think that mentally I was there all the way, you know? It sounded like everybody was in that room. <laughs> your mama, yes. your, your mammy, and your pappy, your grandma, everybody. <laughs> everybody was in there. Yeah, everybody. everybody, yes. And, and they everybody probably was wondering, just like you, is she coming back? I mean, I'm not mm -hmm. being funny. No, I mean, yeah. I mean, it, it, we laugh now. Yeah. But the truth of that is, is yes. she coming back? For real. They told everybody, you know, you gotta you gotta make room for us to come out. Um, and I remember like looking around, kind of looking at everybody as I'm, you know, getting wheeled out, and I'm just like, nobody's coming with me. Like, <laughs> what's going on? I don't know these people. This is a big procedure, you know. And I'm just looking like, oh my goodness, like, oh my god. Yeah, and I, I think I remember some of my family crying as I was getting wheeled out, and I'm just like. But I'm just like, okay, you know, I'm just, I mean, I can't do anything. I think I kind of came to that conclusion as I was getting will. It was just like, it's just is what it is. <laughs> people, people uh, really are wondering if they ever see you again. Yeah. It wasn't, this is no joking yeah. matter here. Right. At all. So you get in this surgery, you don't know nothing. So I guess mom and dad were sitting there just on pins and needles. And how long was this procedure, Renee? They took her in at 5 p.m. That afternoon, Dr. Mitchell did not come out of that OR until 12.30 a.m. the next morning. Mm. Whoa. And he was pouring sweat. Mm. I mean, shirt was drenched and he came out of there and he said, I gave it all I could. Mm. And we knew. Now we had had prayer, Bill. And Dr. Mitchell said, Dude. you know, I'm only a doctor. I'm not God, but I'm going to do the best I can for your daughter. And not only that, prior to the surgery, she had a visit from my mom who had died before she was born. Okay, okay. 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 <laughs> okay. So we 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 didn't touch the spiritual world now. Okay. Just give me a little bit of that. Now somebody came that had already crossed over. Is that what I heard? That's what you heard. Okay. Bill. okay. Can you? Okay. Okay. Can you just give me a little bit of the crossover of what happened? Who saw and all that? Okay. So I walked into the room, my sister and I, uh, one night. And the first thing Cassandra said was, Grandma was here. We just looked at each other like, what? So then we went and sat down on the, the uh, sofa in the room, cried, you know, gathered ourselves. Mm -hmm. And then I went back to the side of the bed and I said, Cassandra, did you say that Grandma Louise was here? And she said, yeah, she came to see me. I, I remember it was nighttime and I remember because my so this is this is how I knew because I hadn't met her because she died before I was born. This wait, is how I knew. Oh, that. oh, you just added some more to the wait a minute, wait a minute. You never <laughs> even met her. Exactly. But you knew who she was. I knew who she was because my mom, so my mom when I was a little bit younger, had told my me and my sister. 
about one of uh, my cousins who was her grandson, my grandma, yeah, my grandma's grandson, who had also had a dream or who had also said that he had, she had came to him as well when he was younger. And he had described what she was wearing and all of that to my mom. And my mom, when she had told me and my sister, had told us, you know, all the description of, you know, everything. And so when she came to me, it was the same description. And so I was like, okay, like, I know who this is. <laughs> I remember her coming and I remember her saying to me, like, kind of like on the edge of the, on the edge of the bed, like kind of by where my head was at um, and like leaning over and saying like, everything will be all right. Yeah. That was all I could remember. Everything gonna be all right. And um, this is the this is the kicker, Bill. There's a kicker. Now, when I was <laughs> uh -huh, when I was a kid growing up, mom would say that to me all the time. Now, Cassandra never met her. Mom died two days before she was born. Mm -hmm. So when Cassandra said that to me, that this is what mom had said to her. I knew it was mom because that's what she said to me when I was a kid. That oh. everything's going to be all right. Okay. So grandma <laughs> came and visited the kid that never met her. Mm -hmm. And everything going to be all right. The mm -hmm. doctor comes out after over six hours. Yeah. And he's drenched and he's tired. And he didn't, he didn't come out saying success. He just mm -hmm. came out and said, I just want you to know I did my best yes y'all getting to me okay <laughs> okay i'm gonna have to switch the screen here while some came in my eye again right after the heart transplant they gave us the opportunity to go down the hall myself my husband one at a time to go see her and you know we're talking to her she's semi-awake um and she's reaching around and touching her body, thinking, okay, well, now I've had the transplant. I'm out of here. You know, I'm just going to get up and walk up out of here. It's time to go. Yeah. <laughs> and so I stood there and explained to her, no, you know, they've got to make sure everything's functioning okay. It's going to be just a few days and you'll be out of here. And she just shed a tear. Mm. Tear just went down the side of her face there, Bill. But she was ready to go. Right. Oh I now yes. that she said that I remember that now mm -hmm. <laughs> being like sad. <laughs> yeah, she was. I, I, she'd been yeah. through so much. Mm -hmm. It'd been since the end of January. Yeah. She was ready to go home. Yeah, and I think because I was awake before this surgery, you know, and I wasn't awake for the other ones. And like I said, all the factors of seeing family members at that point, my sister, you know, kind of having a, under a little bit of an understanding of what was going on. At that point, it was just kind of like, I just want to go home. <laughs> I, I want to, you know, I want to go somewhere familiar. You know what I mean? Yeah, like I, Dorothy and the Wizard of Oz. I want to go home. Yeah. You want to kick your yeah. heels yeah. and, come, and everything. Go back to normal. I mean, art, right. lung, being right. rotated, things down your throat. I'm tired. Yeah. I'm ready yeah. to go home. So what yeah. happened? When, when did we start noticing that? It really is gonna be all right. You know, um, just a few days after the transplant surgery, because, you know, vitals started increasing, her body was maintaining well, mm -hmm. color was coming back, mm -hmm. right. She was more alert, you know, and so little by little, they're weaning her off of the medication and things mm -hmm. like that. Now, prior to the surgery, we had a clipboard. So we would take it in the room and she would write little notes to us, you know, if we were singing to us, she would ask about her grandma, hmm. about her sister, and she would just write things because we wanted to keep her mind active since she wasn't moving. Mm -hmm. So she would just write on the, uh, the clipboard if she had a question or something to say, and we would respond and, you know, show her and read it to her and that kind of stuff, kept that mind active. So how long were you in the hospital after this, after the heart transplant? I can tell you. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Yes, ma'am. <laughs> tell us, Dr. Renee. You're right. Yeah. <laughs> April 8th, she came out. And that was on Easter Sunday, Bill. Mm. That's when she left the hospital. Mm. Wow. Yes, yes, sir. And this is the other part of it. When I left, I didn't have anything. I literally, whew, thank you, Lord, walked out of the hospital 
with nothing, you know? And I remember we went to church. Mm-hmm. Oh my goodness. We went to church that day. We left the hospital mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and we went to my grandma's church because we always have grand- uh, Easter at her church. Nobody in my other, and the rest of my right. family mm-hmm. knew that I was getting out of the hospital that day. And so I remember going into the church and everybody like, oh my gosh, like, oh, it was oh hallelujah God. time. Amen. You know, right. We stomping feet now. We, we running around the church now. Yes. Easter Sunday, she came out, Bill. And yeah, I we, took a we picture rose. of the empty bed. You, you took a picture of what? The empty bed. Okay, mm-hmm. Cassandra. So, <laughs> woo, so you, you're out the hospital finally. Finally, right. Lung and heart. And, oh, and then found a heart that came to you. That was mm. that was something right there. Mm. And Bill, I wanted to add to that too, if I might. You can add. My sister said, who was the nurse of 40 something years, that Cassandra would need a heart that was twice her age. So she was almost 13 at that time. Mm -hmm. Do you know that God provided a heart? The young lady was 26 years old. Mm -hmm. And my sister had said Mm -hmm. in order for her body to completely recover the best that it can, Mm -hmm. she's going to need a heart. That is twice her age, and that's exactly what she got. Mm. Do you do you hear what? Yeah, I know you hear, but I guess I should. Have, <laughs> am I hearing what I'm hearing? <laughs> you know, because I because we have living proof today that God mm. is still in the healing business. Oh and, yes, He is. You know what I'm saying? And, yes, He is. Wow. So after the transplant, you started getting better. They. Had the holler. Mm-hmm. I know it was stomping and crying and shouting. Yeah, it that was. Day. Absolutely. And, yeah, after, and on Easter, we all rose up on that day, yeah. Cassandra. You know what I mean? That's we right. all came up. Can you? Yes, we did. So then, through the years, and did you ever get into athletics? Do you kind of take it easy? Are you afraid? Oh. Do you push? And kind of where are you at in your life today? So when I came back to school, or I, I decided I wanted to finish seventh grade because at the time that I got out of the hospital I think we had like a couple months of school left I'm a nerd so <laughs> I and I you know I miss school too you know like being at school with my friends you know just all that that environment that kind of made me feel like a kid and so I told my parents like I do want to go back to school um all I had to do was take the finals for the class or the classes and then if I passed them I got to go to the next grade I passed him. I went to eighth grade mm-hmm. with my class. Mm-hmm. That I started, amen. Yes, mm-hmm. that I had started with in sixth grade. Um, I got to see my friend. And I remember the day I pulled up to the school. <laughs> I remember us walking to the front door of the school and like everybody, <laughs> my whole class ran up to us and was hugging and hugging me and just, Cassandra, you're back. You know, like it was no, so that's you know, right. You, amen. And I remember, you know, because when the incident had happened on the court, you know, I was playing with my, my, some kids that were in my same classes with me, you know, so they, some of them were actually there when the, everything happened. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I, I, you know, immediately went to the hospital and, you know, they, you know, they weren't able to, they didn't really know what was going on while I was in the hospital. You know, they didn't even know, some of them didn't even know I survived. I remember some of them telling me. And so to have that like embrace was was beautiful was a blessing i just had complications with my blood or something like that and Mm -hmm. i had to so i was like in school and then i had to go yes and get blood transfusions Mm -hmm. at the hospital go back to school Mm -hmm. go back to the hospital get blood transfusions physical therapy all of those things Mm -hmm. and i mean the school year you know was it was going pretty good i was i was happy to be around my friends i was happy to be in class i was happy to be at home you know i felt like things were kind of getting back to normal when i was in the hospital it kind of was just like you know, I was kind of getting accustomed to having a new heart, you know, having to kind of adjust at home with that. And so I think that kind of, I kind of just was like, I got to do the blood transfusion. I got to do it. Finished eighth grade, went to high school. Um, everything was, well, actually, oh my goodness, <laughs> so much. Remember I had the diabetes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. So much. Uh-huh. Wait, there's so, more. Yeah. <laughs> That's why I'm like. 
Oh wow! Wow, Cassandra. So, okay, what? Okay, what is it that you? The blood transfusion. Now what? The blood transfusions was eighth grade, and then um, I ended up having neuropathy. That's mm -hmm. what it was called. Mm -hmm. Neuropathy. Yes. Mm -hmm. Where it was, and it was. I think it was mainly. And it was. Feet. It was my hands and my feet, mm -hmm. and it was like you know, so painful. And once again, I think when it first started, I was. It, you know, it was just like, I had already been through what I had been through in the hospital. So it wasn't, it was just kind of like, okay, I got to deal with this. It's all right. It's not the funnest thing, but it's all right. But then it went, as it started, as it kept going over time, it was starting to get overwhelming. I remember having, waking up in the middle of the night and having the shocks in my feet. And my dad, he, he would look up, he'd be like, what can we do to help this neuropathy in the middle of the night? All of this. And I remember he had me do wall sits. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I mean, do wall, do wall, you know, wall sits when you exercise, you sit on the wall. So I did wall sits, this cream that I would use called mm -hmm. Blue Emu. Yeah. <laughs> that my dad, he found, he was like, we got to, you know, we got to figure this out. I was, I was afraid of water. Honestly, mm -hmm. I was afraid to get in water because yeah. the water seemed like it would irritate the neuropathy. So that was the thing. That was ninth grade. Um, woo. Oof, right. Oof. Yeah, I'm just remembering. I'm, like, I don't I'm, know if I want to add what happened to 10th grade, 11th grade. <laughs> what, I mean, how you, how you still walking and breathing? Shit. Right, exactly. <laughs> yeah, so I started getting massages. Yes. Um, And that ended up helping mm -hmm. the neuropathy eventually go away. Oh. Thank God, because that was, yes. that was, I was very painful. Yes. I would wear gloves to school mm -hmm. because when it would get like really cold, it seemed like it would irritate my neuropathy. I don't want to miss class. You know, I'm in school, so I got to figure it out. And so I remember getting these, these like hang these gloves. Mm -hmm. they, they, my, my fingertips were out, but I had these gloves and I would go into the Dean's office and I was sitting there and she had like this portable heater and I would sit in front of the heater and I would, you know, try to get warm and all of that so that my neuropathy wouldn't get irritated. And then I would go to class, you know, if I was feeling good enough. And then that eventually went away. I think once I started getting the massages and then 10th grade, I ended up having rejection, heart rejection. So that's basically, you know, where your body realizes that the heart isn't yours. And so it basically starts attacking it. So this was like two, three years later. This was about seventh grade. Yeah. About three years later. And now your body is starting to show rejection. signs of rejection. Is this mm -hmm. because of, um, like, do they give you medicine to try to help the body take it? And then do they wean yeah. you off of that? Or did it just start mm -hmm. rejecting? So I, when I first, I remember, and I don't know, like, the technical, you might, my mom might know the technical parts of it, but well, I Dr. remember. Dr. Renee, no. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I remember having to take medicine, um, and it was lit because this is the thing. I had never swallowed pills before you know, this whole situation. And so I had to, they were like, you have swallowed pills. I was like, oh no, like I had to get on something, you know, to make my heart for my body, um, not reject my heart. And so I was on liquid medication for a while. It was so disgusting. <laughs> I remember that about it. I woke up and I was like, I think I can do pills. I think I can take pills now. And I took a pill and I, I swallowed it. And from there I started taking pills. Specifically, anti rejection medication is what it's specifically called. I started off on a good amount of medication. Now I'm I'm only on a few of them, but then you know it was a good amount. They start the patient off with a lot of different medications because they want that organ to be supported in the body as well as possible. Mm -hmm. So they want to just see how everything interacts. Now eventually they take some away, mm -hmm. but in the beginning. You know, they want to support that organ as much as possible to let that brain know, don't attack this. Even though it's not yours, mm -hmm. it's like a fake out. You right. know, don't attack it. Because if that brain says, uh-oh, that's not yours, then you're in trouble. I remember having to go to the hospital mm -hmm. and they had this. Oh, the plasma phoresis. So it's oh, like a cleansing of the plasma. So you've got the red blood cells and you, your blood also has plasma. Mm -hmm. So Cassandra basically had to have her plasma replaced. So they put a, 
a needle in the arm, hook her up to a device. They take the bad plasma out, put the good plasma in, and it needs to match her body. Mm-hmm. Now, the wonderful student that Cassandra is, she decided to write a paper. Uh, the two nurses were taking care of her, and she was in an engineering class at the time, Bill, okay. in high school. So she said, well, why don't I just write a paper about this? I was just sitting there multiple hours in the day right, having this pattern of reasons, and it was just like, I'm just sitting here like bored <laughs> but I have assignments so like why not you know do some of the assignments so I'm okay, there that was smart <laughs> right so I I had it was a paper that I had and I remember asking my teacher like can I write about my actual experience that I'm experiencing right now for this paper and he was like yeah and so I ended up writing the paper I don't even remember what it was. got an A on it too I was getting yeah. ready to say <laughs> so we, I did that. That was wow. <laughs> I made it through high school. Tenth grade was like the last. That experience of plasma paralysis and rejection was like the last kind of major like event that happened while I was in high school. Really. Um, so eleventh and twelfth grade, I didn't have anything. Basically, now that I'm thinking about it, kind of just kept it moving. Honestly. Yeah, physical therapy oh, appointments, just basically building her muscle back because she'd mm-hmm. gotten very small yeah. because she wasn't moving. So mm-hmm. she had to do physical therapy to get her muscles, build her muscles back. Mm-hmm. So you graduated from high school and then what? Yeah, I graduated. And then that was in 2017. Yeah, 2017. Um, and then I... I'm just thinking like God had just been from the beginning to it just mm-hmm. when he said, you know, he he orders our steps. He, you know, has he knows our life before we're even born. Like he he had he has had my life. It's just like this and this and this. So basically, um, uh, you know, apply for college and all of those things. I'm graduating this December. And woo-hoo! come on now. Yeah. Yeah. Let's give a woo. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let's give a shout out to the heart oh, transplant. Know. Thank you God. went through that in college, yes. graduated yes. from college, and you yes. seem to be getting stronger and better by the moment. So I was in this, it's kind of not off topic, but it ties in. So um, when I was from fourth grade to my junior year of high school, I was in this program called uh, Porter Billups Le- Leadership Academy, and it's basically like a summer program for youth. In Denver, and and it's like a like a four, I think four to six week program, and we learn like leadership skills basically. Mm-hmm. And so, if you go to through the program through your um, senior year of high school, and it's at Regis University, and so if you go through the program through your senior year of high school, then they offer you a scholarship to go to Regis. Okay. And so, um, I ended up being nominated by my fourth grade teacher. <laughs> to get into the program. I was asking myself, and you made it through that? <laughs> right. You know, and you yeah. got through that? Okay. <laughs> now, yeah. I also heard that Renee, your mother, mm-hmm. that she wrote something about this? Yes, I did. So, you know, I realized that I was very angry, Bill. Um, I was, I was angry with God because I was asking why 12 years old, a good kid didn't deserve it. Why did this happen? Mm -hmm. So I sat down and decided to write a book. It's called two lives, one heart. And basically Mm -hmm. this is the book here. Mm -hmm. And It's lightning bolts at the top, representing how things happen suddenly. Then all the clouds, which are all the things that she went through, along with the raindrops. Mm -hmm. Then the heart uh, having surgery in the recovery process. We've got the sun here, groundbreaking, because at the bottom, the heart has been transplanted. It's resolved. It's groundbreaking. And I just decided to call it Two Lives, One Heart because it was literally two people, Cassandra and the donor, and how the heart became one. Mm. 
And so that's the book that I wrote. I noticed that as I realized just how good God had been, and I calmed down and got some of that stuff out of my system, you know, I, I just calmed down. I took my time. I had some pictures. Um, I wrote about the donor family. I wrote about Cassandra's experience with mom. Uh, her sister wrote a little chapter in there because, you know, what tends to happen when you have a child that is really ill, the other child or children get forgotten about. They become like these lost children. Mm -hmm. And so even though we had Cassandra, who basically was at death's door, mm -hmm. we also had our younger daughter who was very healthy. We had a lady named Debbie who reminded us, don't forget about your other daughter. And we also saw other couples and families on the heart floor. Mm -hmm. These people had four and five children and the baby was in the ICU or the toddler was in the ICU. Mm -hmm. So it was very difficult to manage taking care of life outside of the hospital. You just want to forget it, but the bills don't stop. The mm -hmm. bills still come. Mm -hmm. So you got to handle that life outside the, the walls of the hospital. And you're making these major life and death decisions while you're in the hospital. So it's just like you never get a break. And then you got to take care of not only yourselves, but your other child, the children, you know, the sibling of the sick child. Mm -hmm. So it's a very, very difficult position to be in. Mm -hmm. Extremely difficult. Is there a way that people can get a hold of the book? I actually have some physical copies here. I've also got it on Amazon. So I sell it at my price. And then, you know, it's, I think, $2.99 on Amazon. So, I mean, I have plenty of copies. Well, thank you all so much for telling your story on Where Were You? If there was anything that you could tell someone that might be in the same particular situation, what would be your advice to someone? Mm. You know, as a parent, what I had with me was my Bible. And there were scriptures, particularly the Isaiah 41.10, the fear not, be not dismayed, for I am the Lord thy God. I will strengthen you and uphold you with my righteous right hand. Mm -hmm. And I had to keep saying that over and over. When you have a child at, that's literally at death's door, you know, it's enough to drive you crazy, literally drive you crazy. So the word of God is what I would tell any parent going through a situation, any situation that is out of your control. Amen. Cassandra. Mm. I think I would say everything would be okay. I also think too that, you know, even after I got out of the hospital, I got home, all of these great things happen. I honestly, I don't think I emotionally, mentally really processed the whole situation for myself. But I know that in the last 10 years that a lot of people have heard my story and, you know, have, have just praised God, like you said, like it has shown that God is still a miracle worker. And I'm grateful for the inspiration that it has given a lot of people. Amen. And so um, I would say everything will be all right. The The experience is not in vain. There's a there's a purpose in it. Mm -hmm. I'm learning, you know, continuing to learn that. Oh, there's um, definitely a purpose for you. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm going to tell you all that God has brought you through. There's a purpose for you. Yes. And I pray that you continue to live on it. Your parents yes. have been there for you. Yes. All of this. And I can tell they love you dearly and seem like you taking that love and you're sharing it to other people. We are yes. really happy that you are where you're at. We're going to continue praying for you, your mother, your family. Thank really you. Really thank you mm -hmm. so much for sharing your story on Where Were You? Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Okay. Be blessed. You be Amen. blessed as well, my sisters. We are. We most certainly are. Okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. Day. Well, 
another episode of Where Were You? And we would like to thank our guests for this evening. Also want to thank New Me. New Me helps sponsor Where Were You? So go on and check it out. New Me forward slash Arcway. Also, go on and hit that like. Go on and hit subscribe. Go on and hit that share. Go on and leave a comment. And if you find anyone that has a story, let me know. And hey, you bless someone today.